We don't normally fire to kill. We always fire to immobilize a person. What we saw was shocking. There were people who were waving at you as if they were begging for help. There was a lot of blame game going on, whether it was the civil traffic police, whether it was the GRIF and all that. When such a thing happens, the army rarely waits for the government orders to officially come into power. Earlier in my life, I had seen many commanding officers would start yelling and wondering why did it happen? I told you it shouldn't happen. But here he was cool. And but there is something unique about the army. And that is Andy Gilman once said, the secret of crisis management is not good versus bad. It is preventing the bad from getting worse. Jai Hind! I am Brigadier Sushil Bhaseen, a military-inspired leadership coach, a global keynote and a TEDx speaker, and an author of multiple books. I experienced military leadership in the Indian Army for 34 years and applied those principles in the education and corporate world for 17 years. My five decades of experience tells me that crisis is a way of life. Big or small, I have gone through all. We have seen that if you are prepared for crisis, you can handle them better. The first major crisis that I can recall that happened in my life was way back in 1980. I was posted in a supply depot in near Tinsukia, which is in the far east of India. We were staying in a small compound surrounded by tea gardens and staying in bamboo-based structures, temporary accommodation called bashas. One day, it was a cold evening and we were having a dinner in our commanding officer's house, the CO's house. In the midst of laughter and music that was going on, we heard a sound that resembled a gunshot. And before we could realize or wonder what's happening, we could hear the Jawans running and shouting and that was followed by the gong of the quarter guard ringing. Surely there was an emergency. We rushed out and saw the Jawans running. We also followed them, went around the double fencing of the supply depot till we reached the incident where everyone had gathered. What we saw was shocking. Lots of torches were flashing through the double layer of fencing and through that fog. And what we, what we could see was what probably looked like somebody lying on the ground. We then got to know that the sentry outside had fired at a suspiciously moving person inside who had no business to be there after 6 p.m. We don't normally fire to kill. We always fire to immobilize a person. So if it was daylight, he would have shot at the feet and made him fall down. But because he just fired in the direction of the sound, he probably killed him. But we didn't know whether he was alive or dead. So I was asked to go inside with a board of officers to determine whether he was alive or injured. The doctor went with us and he declared him dead. We documented the whole thing, came out and then we went to the mess where the commanding officer addressed us. Now the situation was like this, that the commanding officer was on leave and he was going to go out to this family the next morning for a holiday. Technically, the second in command, that is the 2IC, was the officiating CO at that point of time. The commanding officer was cool. He said, gentlemen, something that shouldn't have happened has happened. Now let's see what we can do about it. So he gave us some guidelines and as he did that, we made our notes. Then he left telling the 2IC, please take charge, take your decisions and wherever you get stuck, let me know. After the CO left, the 2IC was the officiating CO, gave us our instructions and based on that, we set out to our work. The whole operation lasted till 3 a.m getting the police, getting everything documented and things done. And then at 3 
a.m. when I went to my basha and as I lay in my bed, I reflected on this experience that had taught me a lot of lessons. The first thing I realized that despite all the preventive measures, the preparation, the planning and everything done what you could do, accidents can still happen because of human error and unexpected situations. The second thing I learned from that commanding officer was the way he was cool. Earlier in my life, I had seen many commanding officers would start yelling and wondering why did it happen? I told you it shouldn't happen. But here he was cool and he didn't waste even a minute in the why it happened and how it happened. He only focused on what to do next, how to resolve the matter. I also found that he owned his responsibility because of his presence, gave us his guidelines, but allowed the 2IC to give instructions. So he followed the balance between not interfering with the authority that was vested in the 2IC as also not absolving himself about not being responsible. What I realized is that in life, there are patterns. We are used to a certain routine. And when that routine gets disrupted, it brings us anger, stress, and we start wondering how are we going to handle that. What happens in a wave? A wave has a pattern of going up and down, up and down. When there's high tide, it goes higher up. When there's a lower tide, it goes up lower up. But what happens when a storm comes or a tsunami comes? The pattern gets broken. People who know how to surf the wave, even when there's a tsunami on, are the ones who can control the situation. Whereas those who can't are suppressed by the waves, commanded by the waves, and they fall down into the water and drown. In all the crises I came across in my life later, and I applied all my lessons which I learned in 1980 in all those crises. I was now better equipped to handle further crises. The next one I remember which came in my life and pops up in my mind the most is of 1994-95. I was commanding a supply depot in Udhampur, which is on the National Highway 44, which, is, which connects uh, Jammu to Sirinagar. It is a big military base there. In 1995 winters, there was a very, very heavy, unprecedented snowfall which came with avalanches and landslides and created a closure of the only link between Jammu and Srinagar and that was the Banihal Tunnel, the Jawahar Tunnel. Because of the blockage of this tunnel, there were more than 1,000 vehicles stranded on either side of the tunnel. It is so cold that the passengers in all these vehicles including the army people who had limited rations for a day or two, they were now suffering from lack of food and water and even clothing. The government and the civil machinery were failing to resolve it. There was a lot of blame game going on, whether it was the civil traffic police, whether it was the GREF and all that. And in the midst, what happens is, that any such crisis then is handed over to the army with what we call aid to civil power. But there is something unique about the army and that is that we in all our operational roles keep thinking of possible adversities, possible contingencies, possible challenges that can come up and we always have some answers of how we are going to combat a particular situation. When such a thing happens, the army rarely waits for the government orders to officially come into power. We start doing proactive planning. That is exactly what happened. A day after this closure of the tunnel, in the command headquarters, planning had started as to how we can help people even when we were not given that task. When I was called, I was told that we have launched or we are planning to launch a couple of helicopters, cheetahs and chetaks to be involved with Air Force and Army Aviation. And we are going to launch a 
welfare oriented helping project while there were other teams that were tasked to rescue uh, dead bodies rescue sick people and provide medical aid and all that i was tasked to look after the food supply because i was commanding a supply depot so once i got to know the general picture which was quite hazy and vague there was no definite information i asked if i can go for a personal reconnaissance and get to know the real situation on the ground myself this permission was granted to me and luckily there were a few helicopters at the airport which were lying on a uh, or which was there on a standby duty now while i was mentally prepared to do what i was doing i started for the helipad but before that i rang up my second in command my toic and asked him to meet me at the helipad why i did this was that while i go on a recce i can leave some of my thoughts with the toic so that he can start planning and we can save critical time so when he came to the helipad i told him what type of food we can drop see that we have uh, what is available what can be made available and the most important which struck me and if he had not looked at that probably we would have had more time wasted later was the packing material in which it is going to be put into the helicopter and dropped because all types of gunny bags and cartons cannot go into a helicopter so having done that i went with a team of army aviation officers and we took off we went straight to the patni top area and from there when we crossed the pass we could see into the valley and at the far distance we could see the convoy trailing end so as we approached where the vehicles were stuck we lowered our height to get a clearer view of the ground what we saw was very very sad there were people who were waving at you as if they were begging for help and you knew that they required help so we went along the road right up to the mouth of the jawhar tunnel because we were only looking after this side of the tunnel and i just tried to see what was the area available at the mouth of the tunnel where we could drop our supplies and all that we then came back the same way and i tried to identify areas where there were patches where there was no village there were no shops obviously these people will be more needy of food than people who were closer to villages and all that and by the way the villagers had come with prepared food to help these strang uh, strangled uh, passengers they came with blankets and woolens uh, there was amazing help that came from the civil public anyway we came back and by the same evening we had launched our first sorty of whatever food was available in those most critical patches the whole night we worked and made food packets and next day we launched multiple sorties of food packets when this news started trickling into the newspapers and uh, tv channels we had lots of people who had said that they were very appreciative of the fact how army helped them in this situation somewhere in my hearts of hearts i had a sense of a small contribution in the whole thing what happened i found that all my lessons that i had learned from crisis management in previous exercises came handy here i could visualize what was the situation we could save time by informing the toic so that he could do something we could see that the food packets were made on time and we could resolve the matter in the best manner that we could in addition to the many lessons i learned from the army there are some which i have distilled into a three point strategy which are simple and will help anyone to combat crisis in any situation the first one is embrace reality accept the situation as it is don't question why it's happening don't pretend it's not happening and don't let fear and panic set in 
the army tells us whether it's peace or war for any situation there are three questions what is the threat means define the situation what is the threat the second is what does it involve and the third is what can i do right now in the present situation these three questions will always help you to come out of a crisis the second lesson is focus on what you have and not what you don't have focus on the solution and not on the problem we always start with why it's happening why me why now it never happened earlier why is it happening now it's beyond you no one did covid no, you can't blame anyone for it it happened accept it embrace reality accept it and then proceed forward the third one is learn lessons bounce forward sam cawthon in his book bounce forward explains this beautifully people say bounce back i used to talk a lot about it in covid if you bounce back you will bounce back to february 2020 and you will be outdated we want to bounce forward to post covid we didn't know when it will be whether 2 months or 6 months or 2 years we didn't know that time but i used to say imagine in with whatever knowledge you have what will be the post covid world like the new world they used to talk about and start preparing for it history shows that in all crises whether they were world war or 2008 recession the world always emerged stronger at the end of a crisis than what it was when it went into it so there's an upswing and therefore if you are today here and you are in crisis plan for an upswing and be prepared to come out here that will give you strength agar aap is stock ke end tak pahunch chuke hain to main aapko josh stocks ka ek dusra roop bhi dikhana chahta hu जिससे मैं काफ़ी देर से जुड़ा हुआ हूं और मुझे बहुत बहुत ज़्यादा पसंद है कि वो क्या कर रहे हैं जो स्टॉक्स ने एक नया ऐप लॉन्च किया है जिसका नाम है जो स्किल्स अब वो नया नहीं रहा काफ़ी टाइम से है लाखों लोग उसको अब यूज़ करते हैं और जो स्किल्स पे आप अपनी ज़िंदगी के लिए कोर्सेज ढूंढ सकते हैं वो कोर्स नहीं जो आपको फिजिक्स केमिस्ट्री कॉमर्स बिजनेस स्टडीज़ पढ़ाएंगे वो कोर्सेज जो आपकी ज़िंदगी में आपको कैसे जीना चाहिए वो सिखाएंगे मैंने खुद जो स्किल्स पे बहुत सारे कोर्सेज बनाए हैं पब्लिक स्पीकिंग पे इमोशनल क्राइसिस कैसे हैंडल किया जाए अपनी पर्सनालिटी कैसे डेवलप की जाए हर एक कोर्स में डेली क्विजेस हैं एक्सरसाइजेज हैं एक बहुत ही खूबसूरत कम्युनिटी है जो आपको सपोर्ट करेगी आपको इनकरेज करेगी आज ही डाउनलोड करें जो स्किल्स का ऐप और उनके कोर्सेज एक्सप्लोर करके अपनी जिंदगी को आगे बढ़ाएं